I have a very special guest today. Uh, we have had great fun. This is a continuation of uh, several programs that we've done here in the last couple of days. And uh, very informative information. I have learned an incredible amount. And I am uh, so happy to welcome a very good friend of mine uh, from the UK that's here with us today, uh, Mr. Big Mick Hughes. Welcome, Mick. Hello, guys. How you doing? All good, I hope. <laughs> All right. There's uh, yeah, so much we could talk about. And also, I want to encourage the uh, listening audience to go to the question and answer box there and go ahead, start right now and put in some questions. Uh, I'll look at those from time to time as we go through this, uh, this uh, discussion. And, uh, and I will uh, bring up some of those questions and uh, get a big mixed view on, uh, on a lot of those topics. So just go ahead and start to, uh, filling that out. And I'll, I'll monitor that and bring those in. So I think one we are always kind of curious to uh, know is, uh, Mick, you and I both have been in this business a long time. It's very interesting to see how uh, people get involved with it that become successful. And whatever started in the first place to introduce you uh, to the business of live sound engineering and mixing. And I was wondering, yep, it just exactly in your case. Where, where, where did you get introduced and what uh, was your desire to? go forward with this sort of business? Well, I think it was in those days, I mean, we're talking quite a while ago, we all sort of fell into this job. We didn't know the job existed as such. Um, it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. There was definitely nowhere to actually go and learn this thing. Um, whatever you learn was through trial and error. I mean, I pretty much messed around at school you know, doing the plays and whatever. There was a little desk that they had. Um, all knobs, no faders, of course, at that point. And I just was the guy who stepped up and was willing to turn the knobs and risk the scales when it fed back, um, which you kind of learn how, what happens pretty quickly. So it was kind of a, at the beginning, it was a very soft start for me. But I was very fortunate. I had a, a, a relative, a cousin that was a guy called Bruno Stapenhill, who was the first bass player in Judas Priest, uh, the very early Judas Priest. And I used to call in and visit uh, Bruno on the way home from school. And I used to do a lot of photography in the early days. And he said to me, would I be willing to take pictures of the band for promo posters and whatever? And I went, yeah, sure, okay. Well, that involved going to a few gigs with them, take some live shots. And I was kind of intrigued by the way the whole live concert thing worked. Uh, and it was kind of, I gravitated always to audio. I mean, in those days, audio consisted of a six channel H and H mixer amp with jack sockets on the front and a volume knob and I think a tone knob. And then it came out a couple of hundred Watts to a couple of Algon columns or a couple of WEM audio master columns, not audio master, just the WEM columns, festival stacks and stuff. Um, and that was it. It wasn't really very comprehensive, no monitor system as such. Um, so I messed around with that, went to concerts with them, emptied the van, loaded the van, did all the bits, slept in the van, did all the horrible bits. Uh, and then when I left school, I completed a five-year apprenticeship at British Steel Corporation in electrical engineering. So I was going along the electrical technical aspect. The entire time, though, I continued to do gigs with the band while I was doing that. Uh, and eventually, I worked for another local band, uh, called, a band called Quartz, and they happened to have their own PA system. And I put the proposal to them that whilst I wasn't doing gigs with them and using the PA for them, why didn't we rent it out to other bands and, and I'll go out and mix it and we'll all earn a bit of money. And they agreed and we did that for a while. Whilst I was doing these small shows, uh, with their PA. I met a guy called Kevin Wilkins, who is now the guy who runs Coachella uh, production and has done for many years uh, in the US. And uh, Kevin owned a lighting company at the time. And uh, because he wasn't very electrical, and I was, I ended up wiring in his mains, all his power and fixing his lighting rig normally because I didn't want him to get electrocuted. And we confirmed friends, and he eventually said to me, you know, do you want to start a lighting company? Join me and we'll go from there. Well, I couldn't afford a PA system, so this seemed like the best move, uh, and we went into doing lights. But I never lost my interest in audio. I had a passion for it. So only my own lighting company uh, introduced me to a lot of local sound companies. 
one of which was a company called Max Volume. They had a Sir in Vegas system, and I worked for those guys off and on for a while, but the whole time there was another company operating in Birmingham, which also was a Serwin Vega company, uh, and it was a company called TechServe. And TechServe was owned by a guy called Bob Doyle. Uh, Bob Doyle, uh, after TechServe, went on to become managing director of Midas. And then when he left Midas, he started Digico and uh, was the original owner of Digico with a couple of other guys. And I believe he's retired now from Digico. I think he still has a vested interest, but uh, he's sort of just about Bob. Great geezer. And so I started doing casual work for Bob, off and on. Did a, a couple of tours, UB40, and a few other short tours for him. Well, eventually he came to me and said, would you go and do this show at Birmingham University for this band called The Armoury Show? And I'm like, oh, Armoury Show? Wow, what's that? You know, guns, cannons, whatever. And he goes, no, 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 it's a band. He says, but they are managed by a guy called Peter Mensch. And Peter Mensch is part of a, a management company called Q Prime. And uh, he manages Def Leppard as well. And Def Leppard at the time were huge. And so he says, be nice to the guy because he's an important manager. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Went off on my motorbike, went in, did the gig, had a good time. Uh, and at the end of the night, Peter Mensch said to me, uh, are you ready? And I'm like, ready for what? He goes, well, you're on tour now. I'm like, uh, no, I'm not. Um, you know, this was a one-off. I was asked, Bob says to come down here and do sound for your band, and that's it. Uh, and I have a motorbike outside, and I don't have any clothes or anything, and this is at like 11 o'clock at night after the show. And he goes, well, you better go and get rid of your motorbike and get some clothes and come back and go to Glasgow tonight, which was probably about an eight-hour drive or whatever. <clears throat> now, that actually was a, a really important crossroads in my life at that point, and, and it only became apparent later because at the time it was just I was 23 uh, probably 23 24 somewhere there and I had a choice really I either went and got rid of my motorbike got some clothes and carried on touring with the armory show or I just went no I'm here for one show and I'm going home now well at that age I was keen and mad for it I don't know if it would have been the same answer now <laughs> but um, I went home, got the bike, lost the bike, got some clothes, went back, and I worked off and on then for the Armoury show for about 18 months. Uh, and then eventually Peter says, look, you know, they're not doing any business. Um, we're going to let them go because we're a business and we have to turn over cash and this just isn't. But we have just, we don't want to lose you. We like what you've done with them. And we've just signed this new band called Metallica. And I'm like, oh, okay. So what's Metallica? And they went, well, Metallica's Metallica, it's heavy metal. And I'm like, what's heavy metal? And they're like, well, you'll find out if you do it. So that was November 1984. Uh, and I was 25, I suppose, 26. And here we are. Uh, and I'm 57. And it's uh, 2015. So it was kind of... Um, <laughs> and there was a serious T-junction in my life. And I, and I, I obviously turned the right way because... I don't think I'd have, um, I wouldn't change what I've done for a living for all this time. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's had its ups and downs, but life does. But uh, what a fantastic career. It's been a roller coaster, but wow, impressive, I think, for myself. I see so many things, and I've been involved in so many things that sometimes I'm just totally in awe of it all. So it's been a lot of fun, basically. A roller coaster of a, of a uh, job description for sure, but that's the thrill of it all. You know, they, they, they vary so much day to day. I think that challenge of dealing with one venue to another and the gigs just, uh, you know, if it's not a routine, it's not your nine to five job, uh, don't you agree? No, absolutely. I mean, if, if that's what you want, if you want nine till five, then you are totally in the wrong world here. You know, you've got to be willing to leave at God knows what time people tell you and be there as long as they want you there. You know, if it's 24 hours, it's 24 hours. There's no unions as such. You're not going to complain to anybody and you better just be willing to get on with it. But the rewards on the other side of it for all that are fantastic. It's, it's, it's such a, a unique thing to do in life. A um, yeah. little bit strange. I think it's a bit of a strange choice of career. 
<laughs> but undescribable, yeah, incredible moments. Uh, tell us about, uh, you know, I've, I've been to a couple of your concerts, and I'll tell you, I, I, I complete respect uh, for the job that you do of the uh, clarity of the system, the power, the uh, the show is uh, so entertaining overall. Uh, uh, the, the show, I think, start to finish is amazing. And I think you have a knack that many people, we have a hard time finding to be able to operate under a, a fairly loud SPL and not have it being abrasive and fatiguing. Uh, you have a, a, a great, a great way of controlling that. Can you share that with us, how you do that? Are you able to mix it uh, at higher sound levels and, and not make it fatiguing? Yeah, I mean, I think you probably think it's a little louder than what it actually is. Um, but it's it's like I said in the little movie that's about, uh, or the little clip or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's it's down to using all the bandwidth and using all the frequencies. It's like there's nothing worse than hearing a sound that sounds incomplete, you know, because it's either got a big hole in it, something missing, or there's a big lump somewhere else. The other thing that we definitely learned early on with um, Metallica was you've got to be very careful with the high mid frequencies. I'm talking 1.6, 2K, 2.5, 3.15, even a little bit of 4, even though as we all get older, we all lose a bit of 4. I know I've lost a bit of 4. I've seen the, the chart. Um, right. But that's just age onset. As you get older, that's, yeah, we all do. You know, it's, it's what happens when you get old. Yeah. So, but fortunately, we have machinery that displays that on a screen, so we can double check how much of that's about the place, if there's too much or not enough or whatever. But it definitely, it's controlling your inputs and controlling that high mid band in guitars predominantly. Now, you don't really want to take them out, take those frequencies out the PA altogether, because so many other inputs actually need them. I mean, snare, toms, vocals for intelligibility definitely need the high mid frequencies to be in correct proportion so if you take it out the system you're going to have none of it in any of it and it'd be quite a soft sounding system but it'd be very mushy i think so i tend to sacrifice um a little bit of high mid in both guitars because i have two uh, maybe if you heard each one individually you might think each one could stand a little more um but when you hear them collectively uh, of course, it, it's enough of those frequencies and only just enough of those. I tend to replace uh, a little bit lost in those frequencies with a little something higher because it's far more sustainable, uh, less punishing on the ears. 2.5K is definitely uh, a killer frequency um, yes. in most inputs, especially constant sounding inputs. Not particularly percussive because it's such a short duration, but... For those long tones in guitar, 2.5K, 2K, wow, that shit will weld you. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. But it has to be there in a certain quantity, just not too much. But what I do is I'll soften the high mids and I'll brighten 5 to 6K. Uh, and that puts the uh, keeps the attitude in the distortion. It still has to be Metallica. Uh, you know, you can't soften it so much that all of a sudden it sounds like a I don't know, Deep Purple or something, because they're kind of soft tones, you know. This, The attitude to heavy metal guitars is definitely different to what I would consider a rock band. Like when I did Def Leppard and I did Ozzy Osbourne, I would not have gone for the same tone of guitar for those guys mm -hmm. uh, because it just wouldn't work. Um, it has to be, you have to bring something to the table. You, you have to help the band create what needs to be created to make them who they are you know every band has its signature sound if they are successful that is yes. and you have to help them to maintain that and to, and to put it over to the audience so is it actually you know it is them mm -hmm. so i think number one thing is controlling the high mids absolutely another thing i've always tried to do uh is i like to try and feature i guess things that in the beginning, it's less prevalent now. Technology's moved on. But in the early days with the old PAs, of course, they predominantly did a lot of these high mid frequencies because that's how they created like a false volume. You know, if you took the Harwell, the old Harwell system or even, um, you know, the JBL horns on a Martin system could get going a little higher than 2.5K normally for those. But they all had this high mid attitude, which gave a PA 
the impression of being quite loud when really it wasn't. If you sacrifice those frequencies out of the PA, what was actually left wasn't really that powerful. Not the case now, though. Uh, you know, modern day PAs are powerful. You know, with linear PAs now, it's, it's not a problem. If you, if you lose 2.5k out of an input in, with a guitar, then of course it gives you the opportunity to turn it up a little bit, which brings up all the other frequencies of the system and they're all present in the system so all of a sudden you have this scratchy uh guitar thing going and which could cause a scratchy sounding mix overall mm -hmm. you lose that you turn the guitar up and the attitude changes that the thing suddenly becomes much fatter and much more full because you've actually brought up these lower frequencies it's a, a bit of a no-brainer really but making the call on these amount of high mid frequencies is really important um, Mention. i yeah. always liked the, i was going to say what i like to do was to feature with the old pas what i used to do is i used to force them to do overheads and stuff because you never really in the old days you never really heard many symbols it was very difficult to get things of high fidelity over through these old pas and more often than not tom toms would be sacrificed in the mix you wouldn't be able to hear them so when i came when i started doing this i was determined to to champion the cause if you like of inputs that had never been heard very well in i'm, I'm predominantly talking about heavy rock metal music I'm not really talking about any other genre um but of course in rock and metal everybody was afraid to have the, the overheads too loud because of the stage volume um you know, Tom Toms used to be sort of overlooked a little bit because they were there, but they were always a bit dull and a bit boxy sounding. So I decided I weren't going to have that. I wanted to do the, um, I wanted to hear each symbol. I wanted to definitely hear the Tom Toms, which is why I have six overhead mics because I, each symbol has its own microphone. So I was determined to have these symbols heard and position them in the mix. So now I use six DPA microphones and each one of them is, I spread them in a stereo image, not very wide because of the environments I work in. Because obviously if I pan something in one side of the PA, I have half the audience isn't going to be able to hear it because they're all over there. And the other half's over here, so you might only have two cymbals over there or three cymbals and three over there. I can't do that. You know, things like chinas and ride cymbals are down the middle with the snare hi-hats down the middle okay i'll pan some of the crashes um <clears throat> but not anything drastically because i want everybody to be able to hear them it's the same as panning uh guitars you can't go too far because if you go too far people are just only getting half the half the show so to speak so stereo panning has to be very carefully done um we were talking about sound systems that. too, which is uh, definitely uh, 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 the next subject we want to count, uh, cover in depth. But as we were talking about, uh, you know, you've already shown a honing in on uh, your listening skills when you listen to these various elements to either tune your system or to do your mix. Uh, there's a good question that, that uh, we haven't seen this one before. I think it's really good. How do you improve that ability uh, to hear uh, distinct sounds or just improve your hearing ability? Have you you have a, a thought on that? Yeah, no, no, good question. No, good question. I think um, the longer I've been doing this, um, I think I've sort of honed my ability for for listening, for paying attention, um, for honing in on things. It's like you know, I've taught a lot of people to engineer. Um, and one thing that became really apparent to me, when you teach somebody, you can kind of observe what happens to them while they're engineering without having to listen to the mix yourself. You're watching them uh, listen. And it became quite apparent in the early days with me that if you are touching uh, the console and you're touching one of the knobs uh, on the desk, then you are predominantly honed into listening to just that input. You know, I mean, I can... The whole band can be playing, but I could be just listening to the snare drum or the hi-hat or the tone or whatever. Just one channel. I can completely zone out everything else and just listen to this one input. So, But what I also found is that I needed to step back and listen to the overall mix because that's what we're all there for. So I found that stopping what I'm doing and taking my hands off the knobs and faders 
and just looking at the stage and listening means I, I move into being one of the audience. I try to become one of those and go, well, you know, would I be enjoying this if I was just in the crowd right now? Would I? Can I hear what I want to hear? You know, he's playing this. Can I hear it? Is it right? Can I understand what the vocal, what he's saying and what he's singing? And, you know, you, you do these million scans all the time. Um, but eventually you have to stop doing the intricate scan of everything. Oh, look, that one hi-hat hit was like this, or that one snare hit, he didn't rim shot it or whatever. You've you got to stop doing that, and you have to start looking at the overall picture uh, and start mixing the show for the overall thing. Um, how can you improve your listening? I think it's a thinking thing. I think you... I kind of reason it into... Uh, a thought process. I think frequencies, I still think numbers, even though I definitely advocate stepping away from the numbers and listening and mixing sound. I do think numbers. If I hear something, I can think mm, 250, 1K, you know, blah, 2K, whatever. I, I do think like that. And then I tend to do that, then translate it to touching the knobs and, and seeing how those frequencies affect. And I will go for a bit of boost just to make sure, just to reconfirm in my mind that it is that frequency. I'm, I, I do think it is what it is, what I'm thinking it is. Uh, not always right. Sometimes I can be way off. It shocks me sometimes. How can that be actually 500 when I actually thought it it was 250 it's almost like i hear the octave sometimes or you know i don't know maybe it's a harmonic thing but um since these new pas and they're so clean and linear it's 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 pretty apparent and any frequency shifts that you do any eq or whatever wow i mean we used to make things move you know three or four db eq we'd use you know tick three or four db out you know straight away graphic or or a, a parametric now, I mean, I'm talking about 1 dB, half a dB. You can hear it. It's right there. It's not like the old days where you have to grab a fistful. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all very softly, softly now with all the stuff. It's, it's a bit like driving a Ferrari with some of these uh, PA systems now. I mean, you know, the Mayo ones are dead linear. I mean, you can literally just crack the knob and hear the difference. Which and when did you first like encounter your Meyer Sound products? When were you were speaking of that now? How did you uh, get involved? We understand you use the Leo family of products quite a bit and, and the 1100s as well. So using these sound systems as you were just describing, uh, when did that occur and, and how's that worked for you? Yeah, um, the first time I ever used uh, Maya was we were uh, going between uh, Europe and America on a tour. I can't remember which tour it was, but we had a gig come up in uh, Iceland, Reykjavik, Iceland. And I'm like, whoa, is there any PA in Reykjavik, Iceland? I mean, do they have PAs? And uh, they did, and it was a Maya PA. Now, I'd never really considered Maya as a contender in my world. I knew they did a lot of hi-fi sounding gigs, but I didn't consider uh, heavy rock music as requiring anything that got remotely hi-fi. And I, uh, well, I just said, yeah, why not, you know, uh, let's give it a go. Um, turned up, Luke Jenks was there from Maya Sound to make sure the system was all singing and dancing. And uh, I was really impressed with it. I was really surprised, in all fairness, because... Uh, this gig, we had one-sixth of the population of Iceland, apparently. <laughs> Whatever that is. I think it was one-sixth. And it was in this big aircraft hangar kind of thing. And it was a very long, tubular shaped thing. And it it was very cold outside. So everybody turned up wearing lots of uh, snow gear. They were all dead wrapped up. And they heated the place later on in the day, unbelievably. <clears throat> so it was very, very warm in there. And during the show, um, I noticed that, you know, the high end was going off a little bit. And it's like, wow, hmm, okay, cymbals are starting to go off the boil a bit. Snare, top end's going off. Vocals doesn't quite have the diction that I like. So I grabbed the tablet, ready to shelf it. It was only an atmospheric change that had caused this to go on. You know, the humidity and the temperature had gone up. So I grabbed the the tablet ready to shelf it and Luke goes what are you doing and I'm like well I'm about to shelf the system um, because it's not um, 
it's not bright enough. I'm starting to lose things now. And he's like, wow, no, no, don't do that. Let me do it. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do? And he goes, well, we have a, I'm going to press an execute button. I'm, I'm going to dial in the temperature and the humidity. And the pro, the unit was an LD3 at the time. <clears throat> he goes, and I'm going to press the execute button. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we're going to trust this button then. You're going to just press this and hopefully the whole mix isn't going to go berserk. It's not going to start feeding back or it's not suddenly get, going to get really weird immediately. And he's like, no, no, it'll be fine. <clears throat> well, the only thing we'd ever seen up until that point that would have done something like that was uh, a probe that you used to plug into a VSS Omnidrive, and it was the, the seaweed probe. Uh, apparently, it had seaweed inside it, so I was told at the time anyway. Um, somebody might come back and say, that's bullshit, but... We understood it was a piece of seaweed that obviously changed its resistance as per temperature and um, humidity, and, and that hence would control the crossover. Well, of course, there was no way we were going to allow a piece of seaweed to get involved in controlling the crossover. So I was a little apprehensive of this, oh, yes, it'll sort it out. But he, and I'm like, but go on, then in for a penny, in for a pound. And he pressed the button, and the system just left back into life. It was, wow. It was like there was nobody in there to get it. it was like in the you know early on and i'm like whoa this is pretty clever and it was the first time i'd ever been exposed to a company <clears throat> that seemed knowledgeable enough or willing to uh acknowledge the fact that atmospheric pressures and temperatures and hum and uh, humidities made a difference to the audio up until that point you just sort of turn the pa on and you eq'd away and went at it these people were like going no no we understand that things change and we've now incorporated this to help you and it's like wow so i said to paul owen uh, who was the monitor engineer for metallica at the time i said paul you need to pay attention with these people because this is they're smart i hadn't seen this level of smartness before um and i had well eventually obviously paul went out and bought 200 odd boxes and we proceeded to use the milo system on our in the round future tours and it made perfect sense to go for the milo for that because when we did in the round tours previously with that with mt4 uh alpha um nexo alpha we had to run incredibly long speaker leads and normally capture like a quarter of the arena floor for all the amp rack world i mean we literally built like a fortress out of amp racks and ran um, speaker leads like I think the longest run we ever had was about 400 feet which even using oxygen free Van Damme cable still affected the impedance to the amplifier and also slight tonal changes to the box itself and volume changes so it's like shit this doesn't really work and we're taking up prime real estate with the amp racks if we were going to move the amp racks to out of the arena the speaker leads would have been 650 feet long. We'd have been, I'd be lucky if the, we'd have got more than a transitor radio out the far hangs. So we had to do this thing. So when we, when I went into really thinking about it, a powered box beat heavier than an unpowered box. The other benefits were immense. The other problem with speaker leads, of course, is when you have that many of them, they have to get to the ground to get to the AMRAX. So you end up with these huge swages of cable that were at sight line issues, just a complete pain in the ass. And, you know, it was just horrible. So when we did the powered box thing with the Milo, it was very easy to put a power feed, a power up to the grid, and we used optical for the power, for the signal feed and to distribute it all up top on the mother grid at the top. And perfect, absolutely bang on way to do it. Um, and then, of course, the other issue of in the round shows is um, in the nature of what they are. You're firing boxes in every which way, how direction, and you create your own ambience. So you're at one end in one corner mixing the show. You're listening to probably one, maybe two hangs in like a stereo thing. You're in, in the triangle. And then you've got another 10 hangs or something all generating the ambience in the room. Now, if the room's really reflective, you get more... You're trying to mix the show with more reflections than, than you could ever imagine. And with you can hardly hear the two hangs that are pointing right at you because the ambience is so high. 
Um, we took to just turning up my actually hangs that I listened to just a couple of dB to try and help me get above the ambience in a few of the gigs. Um, and then, of course, you get into the problem of multiple subsources. You know, you're flying subclusters here, there, and everywhere, and it's patchy and it's really difficult to get it to be nice and even and smooth. So um, along came Thomas Mundorf and came up with the TM array, which was a fantastic idea because point source and because we hung it 10 deep uh four columns of 10 <clears throat> it, it the pattern control was phenomenal i mean you could there was no sub underneath it it definitely controlled the pattern to fire out in line with the, its array size and in fact it got so controlled that to get any sub on the floor because the stage was so low we couldn't actually put subs around the perimeter of the stage because it was too low because the band wanted to be close to the people. So we had to get low end from the TM array on the ground. Now, it, it became such a beam around that centre portion, like a, an antenna radiating out, that we had to split the array up into three sections and delay the bottom section to steer some sub down onto the floor, and that's what we did. Uh, as well as having to... We couldn't really do much infill around the edge of the stage because it was low, kind of pointless blasting somebody's face off when they're the only person that can hear it. Um, so it's like, wow. So then we have to bend the Milo unbelievably um, and put 120 degree boxes on the bottom to fill right up to the edge of the stage. Very difficult situation in the round. Um, I prefer 180. I prefer 180 outdoors in flat fields, of course, because the system working in free air is just in its it's in its element. It's like when you come to talking about EQing systems, you know. <clears throat> um, I normally walk into these festivals and I'm like, okay, um, let's have a look at your system EQ. And it's it's if it's got more than you know, if it's got eight points on the go, there's something wrong. The boxes don't sound that bad any of the manufacturers in today's modern PA world, none of the arrays sound that bad. So why the need to do eight EQ points on the system EQ is just beyond me, to be honest with you. I, I normally switch them all off. It normally Jay Day, my assistant, normally does this in the day before I get there, but more often than not, I'll come in and put even more of them in. <laughs> back into the system because you know you create these holes and you effectively damaging every input that you put through the PA it's it's just going to be tailored because they felt there was too much of this and they took it out and now all of a sudden everything you put through the system is as a little piece missing which gives you some very weird and horrible artifacts from that point um, I mean PAs don't sound that bad out the box you know, straight away, as soon as you buy them, you plug them in, even in the native configuration with Maya products, you know, going no system EQ as such, going live and direct to the boxes, they sound really good. It's definitely usable. So the need to hack and chop, okay, we get it. You know, the longer a line array gets, there are some interactions between the boxes, but they're well documented and well, well sortable. I mean, and certainly not off the dial and depending on the angles between the boxes is the frequency that you, you have to mess with so no keep it simple basically um keeps you, your, your headroom there keeps everything running very nicely with a linear viewpoint and the native setup that you just mentioned it uh, seemingly i mean these tours are getting more and more uh, semis more and more trucks coming in uh, the system just goes up faster and I think gives the engineer more time to do work that he uh, needs to do really from the console standpoint and not so much tweaking all afternoon. So do you agree to that? That's obviously an advantage to the engineer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you, you don't want to be chasing your behind around, you know, it's like yeah. if you're constantly having to boost something on the on the desk then the system's lacking in it. It's a bit like the same thing if you're having to take out a frequency on every channel, then it's pretty obvious the system may be a little hot at those frequencies. So you can mm -hmm. definitely calibrate things to make it easier. But of course, you know, things are going to change when the people come in. You're going to have to make some mods um, with, 
you know, as you go along. Mm. Um, it, when I was using the Milo system, I said to John, which is where the Leo sort of came from, I said, John, I'm, you know, I, I ghost the VHF. And for people who don't know what ghosting means, it means I just flicker the, the, the limit light on the, the VHF drivers. Uh, and I said, you know, it's, it's the kick drum attack. You know, I have maximum attack everywhere on all the percussive stuff. And it's ghost in the VHF. And he's like, hmm, okay. So he, he sort of went away and came back with the uh, the Leo system. And he's like, see if you can ghost that. Well, I've never ghosted that. It's not really possible, I don't think. That PA, I tell you, it should come with a public health warning because <laughs> to be that clean and yeah. to get that loud, you know, most PAs, you couldn't even begin to think of running them at the level you could run a Leo system. Just through the pure distortion that's inherent in the system, that makes it sound more aggressive and more grr, you know uh -huh. that leo system's like it's so clean that it's like yeah it's dangerous I, I mean i you have to you have to watch the volume you have to you have to keep an eye on it i mean i run a 10 easy system now so i can watch the volume um because i think that we're going to be into a problem with all this in a minute it's becoming becoming quite apparent uh, that around Europe, that the 98 or 100 dB noise limit is becoming more and more prevalent. Everywhere you go now, it's like, this is the noise limit, this is the noise limit. And I think we're being given a choice as engineers at the moment to, to uh, agree to do these numbers with them um, without being forced horribly, um, because they don't really have any power over you. They can ask you to do it. They can't really do anything to you, so they ask you and tell you it's the law in the area. But they don't say you're going to be fined $100,000 or whatever. You know, they, they don't give you any of that. It's just, please don't do it. Now, we are being given a chance to self-moderate, I think. You know, we either comply now or these people are going to go away and they're going to put this into some kind of legislation and then we're going to be forced and it's going to be, um, it's not going to be very nice. It's nice to be asked and not to be told. I mean, the only time I can remember where I felt like I was really told was uh, when I did Wembley Stadium, um, the Freddie Mercury's dead gig. And uh, I got out to the desk and there was a, a letter on the desk with my name and address on it. And I opened it up and... and it was just sitting between the knobs, so I just came along and went, oh, what's this? I opened it up, and as I pulled the letter out the envelope, it had a, the City of London crest at the top, or City of Westminster, it might have been, something like that, but they pulled it out. I should have kept it, actually. I think I'll probably have it somewhere, but it pulled it out, and it was a direct threat that they would uh, be coming for me, not the band. It, it, normally, that kind of stuff's aimed at the band, and they can kind of leave it to the management to deal with. No, no, this had my name on it, saying I personally would be held responsible for this. Needless to say, I behaved incredibly well that day and was very good. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. It was kind of fortunate because the PA wouldn't actually go that loud. Um, it wouldn't. I don't think the PA would have got into infringement, to be honest with you, because it just didn't. It was, to describe the PA, it was a, a 2B18, 4B10, 2 two inch horns and was in a very thin narrow box that stacks across trucks in an equal measure quite well it's about four foot square black you probably know what it is but mm. um yeah. yeah so i think we've got a choice here we either start to work with them now or we will be forced to do what they tell us later so i'm starting to uh monitor uh, my overall volume with the 10 Easy, which is a fantastic little programmer, you know, gives you the LEQ over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to behave. I'm kind of surprised, actually. I mean, he, I, when I first turned it on with my old show file, I was actually only doing 101 dB A weighted. Yeah, and for people who don't know the difference between A and C, A weighted is being uh, measured through a filter that rolls off below 500 hertz progressively and C weighted is flat so you always want to be measured A weighted because it's a lower number uh, and uh, if they ever say C weighted oh it's all bad 
That's what will probably happen. If we don't behave, they're going to go, okay, it's 100 dB and it's sea weighted. Oh my God, that would just kill me. I couldn't even, I wouldn't want to be a sound engineer then. Because the way I get around the 100 or 98 dB uh, limit is, I lean on the low end progressively because that's not been metered as much as the high end. If you have a PA that's a little bit scratchy and a little bit high midi, you're going to tip the noise limit immediately. But if you're a little bit chunky and you've got balls in the low end, that's not being metered quite as much as as it is in the highs. So it's the way to go is to is to beef everything up and don't have it quite as brash sounding. Uh, and you can get away with murder with the noise police on that front. Hmm. Well, to begin a discussion on uh, which we think is very interesting on compression and noise gates, signal processors and such, uh, one question is, is do you use compression on the uh, complete mix or the, the, the left-right mix bus? Uh, you can either bring that in or just or start a discussion what you and how you use compression and gating. Okay, let's, let's, just, let's just talk compressors. I can honestly say that in my career I have tried to compress absolutely everything that's ever made a noise. Uh, and that goes from all the inputs to the L and R bus compression. Now, left and right bus compression, I've tried SSL, Neve, I've tried them all. And the real pieces, I'm not talking plugins here, I'm talking the actual thing. And I never liked it, I have to be honest. I don't want to go for a big part in a song, a uh, big kick and snare, big delay on the vocal, big whatever, just you want to go there, huge guitar solo, because that's how you feel, and that's exciting, and that's the song. I don't need something sitting in a rack that fights all the movements that I do. You know, I rook something up, it turns it down. No, I don't like that on system bus compression. I am, in fact, I... No, just wrong. Just wrong. I just... its We're not mixing an album. We're not having to fit within a certain volume guideline, other than the system going red, of course. But I'm not looking to broadcast this on the radio and being afraid that it's going to go over or on TV. No, no, I can, I'm not going to narrow the dynamics of the band by putting a, a, a bus compressor on there. Why would I want to do that? I'm not trying to fit in any window other than the one that you can actually hear happening there and then. Now, when you start talking about channel compression... Uh, I do use compression, obviously I do. I do think that predominantly in live music, we do use uh, limiters as opposed to compression. I think it's very difficult to fit uh, what I would consider real compression into a live situation um, because of lifting the noise floor. You know, you're in a studio, you've got isolation, you can lift the noise floor as much as you want. It's the ambience that you're after to give it the size. We don't need to do that. We're already playing into a huge ambience most of the time. And we're, the last thing I want to do is to be creating more ambience. Um, so for I do use parallel uh, kick and snare compression. Uh, and that just sits there on a subgroup. I route to two subgroups. Well, actually route to more than two, but... The, the parallel kick and snare compression occupies a subgroup, and I just compress that group and add it back to the mix bus. Uh, and that's there predominantly for if he doesn't play as hard for a certain part because it's a double kick pattern and it needs it starts to dive a little bit on the kick volumes, then as he plays softer, the compression lifts on the makeup and the makeup gain comes into play and replaces the few dB that he's um, backed off on. I mean, I use quite heavy compression on that and there's quite a lot of makeup gain available to it and relatively fast, um, not massively fast attack, a little bit of up on the attack to allow some of the transient through, a little bit of a transient designer plot. Um, and then the release accordingly. Of course, if you have a kick drum that releases too soon, then you are going to start to expand the rumble in the kick drum, the shell noise, because obviously the compressor envelope finishes, 
starts releasing the compression, which effectively starts to put the makeup gain back in. So if the noise the mic's making at that point is just the shell rumbling inside, then you are going to lift that, and your kick drum is going to have not so much as a duff, it's going to be a doom. It's going to drag the tail out. If you have a sustain, uh, sorry, a release time that is longer than the kick drum sound itself, then of course the kick drum will stay at the same level. It won't be lift. It'll only uh, release after the kick drum sound has happened, and won't be bringing up all the shell noise. Now, I use that kind of thing uh, in a different way for the snare drum. The snare bottom, I like a good spring sound. And anybody who's ever heard my mixes, I, I'd be surprised if you came to me and said I couldn't hear the the, the snare. Uh, bottom because I like the sound of the springs it's a snare drum after all so what I tend to do with that is I can press the bottom snare mic a little hef more heavily uh, I allow the attack to come through so I don't lose the transient then I go into about a three to one compression so it pulls back the middle bit and then I set the release time so as it, it actually starts allowing the envelope to decay so to speak so i did the makeup game back in now before the snare entire sound is finished so it starts lift the tail end of the springs rattling i hope i'm explaining this well enough but um so you once again it comes down to the the release time as long as it's shorter than the length of the snare it means that the compressor will have released and added the makeup game back in while the sound of the snare is still happening and adds the springs back in, which gives you a nice uh, spring sound on the bottom of the snare. Bit of the reverse plot to the kick drum because I don't want the kick drum giving it the boom. Mm, I want the kick drum just to go duff. So I want to make sure that the release time is longer than the kick drum is. Um, so that's a little thing with compression. Vocal compression. Um, I tend to go for the limiter. I'm not looking to bring the breath out. You know, if if you're doing something in a studio and you you know you hold the vocal in hard compression all, all the time, so as when they stop singing while they're taking a breath, all of a sudden the release happens. It adds all this makeup game back in, and all of a sudden you can hear them breathe in. <gasps> you know, we've all heard it. It sounds lovely on recording, and if you've got a fantastic singer to be able to accentuate that breath is really nice but unfortunately when you suddenly add possibly 10 db of makeup gain to a compressor that suddenly releases that 10 db in the pa will probably feed back at worst case scenario at best case scenario i guess it just makes the stage sound really ambient so you've got to be really careful so with vocals i have uh how many vocal mics do i have i have 14 uh vocal mics all distributed around the stage for i could not bring up the noise floor that much so predominantly my vocal compression is set uh as a limiter it's probably six to one five to six to one uh moderately quick attack not immediate but moderately quick and a relatively quick release so as to allow it to grab the peak if he shouts or somebody else shouts or somebody out the audience jumps up and shouts because I've had that happen where the band's been playing along and all of a sudden somebody's singing along with them and you can't see them because I've got all these vocal mics and some are right out in front of the PA on the wing and there's been some guy over there singing along with the band. It's pretty funny, actually. So, yeah. um, no, the, the compression thing, careful, very careful. I mean, cymbals, I'm, I might have to try this again, you know, and see if I can get it to work because I used to love to, to compress cymbals because when you compress overheads wow I mean there's a there's a whole wealth of stuff in there um, you know you, you, it's the same plot again as the doing the snare bottom you know you can set up allow the attack through grab the middle bit three to four to one I would say quite heavy on cymbal because it's a big transient and then make sure the release time times out before the cymbal sound stops decaying. And as the makeup gain adds back into the compressor, it turns up the decay of the cymbals. So all of a sudden, 
a symbol that would normally go psh and fade away is psh. It's longer because it drags the symbol up to be louder from the quiet bit, so to speak, as it's, as it's decayed. But of course, like I said, the noise floor is always a noise. And of course, doing that with overheads would, would actually drag up the rest of your drum sound within it. You'd have toms, snare drum, and everything else going with that. Now, that can be desirable, that amount of nice, if it's good ambience and it, and it works. Your problem is, is if your phasing starts to go a bit tits up with your snare drum can start to get a bit thin. You know, if the snare's reaching the overheads in a weird phase angle to the real thing. What I tend to do is, uh, when I'm in those sort of situations, is I will use a recorder, you know, Pro Tools or... Uh, 9696 for the Midas or other recordings, something I can see the waveform, hit the snare drum and then have a look at how long it takes before it arrives on all the overhead mics. Now, when I did Led Zeppelin, I did this and it was three milliseconds because it's about three feet from the overheads and from, I had an XY pair on that. So, of course, it was all, they were, the snare was all over that as well. But it's three milliseconds out. So, so it made the snare go a bit thin. So what I did is I delayed the snare drum back three milliseconds. So it had time to get on the ambience. And then it became in phase again. And it made the snare nice and fat. Um, you're only messing with small milliseconds. I would never suggest going to huge numbers on these. You can Two or three milliseconds is pretty indistinguishable, really. Uh, I think you're kind of safe on that. But of course, with the digital consoles, it gives you the latitude to do that. So, um, that's compression. Uh, are you seeing any more questions about compression, Buford? Yeah, there? The, uh, there was a couple. In fact, I think uh, uh, one here or two about uh, sub-bass, uh, well, not so much compression, but latency and uh, how do you deal with... Uh, the subs, you, we talked about the Moondop array, okay. the TM array, yep. but yep. how do you work with that, and do you compress your subs okay. at all? And when we're talking about the system. Okay. Now, I don't like to, com but we'll go, we'll stay compression just a nanosecond then. I don't like to, com remember we're going to talk about Gates Buford, all right, but we'll finish That's this right. That's right. That's um, right. Um, well, I don't compress subs. More often than not, the system is protected. If it's a Maya product, then obviously there is a, uh, a, as a final protection that will happen if you get way, way out of control. So, no, I don't compress the subfeed. Uh, if I want dynamics to come at me, then I don't want the sublow being pulled back out of proportion with the main flown system. So, no, I would not uh, compress subs. Latency? Okay. This is one of the reasons why I never turn up at a gig and they go, well, what are you going to give us, left, right, and sub? I go, no, I'm going to give you left and right because I want your speaker management system to be the one uh, that keeps everything in alignment. I don't need to be sending you left, right, and then an aux with sub on that I don't know what the path length's going to be. If I had an EQ just on that sub, that could change the path length hitting the system. Now, they've going to have done their uh, smart or uh, sim trace. They're going to have lined up the subs with the system, and then I'm going to presume to come along and give them a, an independent sub feed that none of us know what time frame it's in. Okay, we could probably get around it by um, timing through my console, but of course, if you think about timing subs to, an, to a system, you time it at the crossover point. Now, subs are not a square blob. It's, this isn't like a square wave. Subs have sloping sides. Now, if you take the blob of sub and you turn it up and down, the crossover point's changing. Where it meets the main system, the rest of the system is changing because of the slopey sides. Depending on the roll-off, of course, the, the actual dB per octave, um, and the filter, you know, Butterworth, Linkwitch Riley, whatever it is, as you turn this thing up and down, the crossover point is sliding up and down. So you're supposed to retime the sub package every time you change the volume. So if I've got this thing on the console 
and I've got a fader on it. I'd be too tempted, I think, to keep moving this thing around. So I like the fact that it's on the system. It's in perfect, uh, perfect latency. It's all time managed. Uh, it's in alignment with the feed that they're receiving. It should be perfect because it's, it'll be the factory program uh, that's running it all. So, no, I don't like interfering with uh, the alignment of the sub versus system thing. Okay. All right, that's a good explanation. Now, back to Gates. Oh, no, actually, hang on. What, one other thing, one other thing we did. Sure, go with ahead. The TM array, mm. With the TM array, subs in the middle, we obviously, with all the hangs running around the perimeter of the stage, we could not delay all that back to the center because you're talking 40, 50 milliseconds of delay and you can't really do that. That's just a bit too far. So uh, what we ended up doing was lining up the waveform, which basically means that you're not lining up the leading edge of the waveform because that would mean that you'd have to delay the all the other arrays back. You're just making sure that stuff's in phase it could have meant that stuff was slightly accelerated. Um, it was such an ambiguous thing. We had so many discussions about how to time it in the round system. But uh, fundamentally, it worked that we lined up the waveform. So the sub, where it met the array, was in phase. I see. Interesting. Okay, so... Does does that work with everybody on that plot? And we'll move on to Gates then, yeah? I believe so. And if there is further questions, just go ahead and type those in, and then I will refer back to that. But let's do step back to, to noise gates, a very interesting topic there in your viewpoints. Yes, absolutely. I mean, noise gates for heavy rock, heavy metal music is an important thing. I mean, you know, you have to... It's all about cleaning up the signal, signal management, and... Let's be honest, a noise gate is a, gate is a great thing to, to make something tidy and make it stand alone, you know. But there are a few things that I've observed over the years that people seem to not quite grasp with noise gates, that you can make them your enemy so far as having to do too much EQ because of them. And what I've witnessed pretty much is attack. It's pretty obvious that on a percussive input, you want the fastest possible attack. As that stick hits that drum, you want that gate to be open to capture all of that. Because the first sound that's obviously made is when the stick hits the plastic head. The first sound is a high frequency, which adds the attack to the drum. Now, what I've seen people tend to do is, if they, normally they'll turn the attack knob to fastest it can possibly be, which is obviously where it needs to be. Uh, assuming you do want an attack sound. I mean, I suppose there are bands about that want a soft tom-tom sound, which means you may take the edge off, the leading edge off the drum to make it sound soft. But predominantly in the music I do, it's got to be a fast attack to get that initial thing happening, so it's right up front. But what people don't quite fully grasp is that the key filter can also slow down your attack. Because if Let's say we're doing a floor tom, a big floor tom, and you're like, okay, where am I going to set the key filter for this big floor tom? And you're like, well, it's going to make a lot of bass, so let's set it low. The problem is the very first noise that it makes, like we said before, was when the plastic tip of the stick hits the plastic head and makes a click. If your key filter's set down at 1500 hertz, it's not even going to see that. So it's not going to activate the gate until the swell of the floor tom happens and there's enough low end to make the key filter operate the gate at 1500 hertz. So you're effectively a change in the attack time of the gate just with the key filter being too low. Now I get it. You know, you start sliding your, your key filter up to 2, 3, 4K or whatever, so as it gets this big click and you straight away into the overhead portion where you know that ride symbols right next to the floor tom so tap 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 on the on the ride all of a sudden you hear the floor tom go ping 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 you get all these noises and shit i get it it's a bit difficult but there is a there is a point there a split point where you can 
fetch it back on the key filter. I mean, even 500 would be far better than something much lower to keep the attack in the gate. But be aware that as you move the key filter, you will hear an acoustic chain. As much as I say, oh, it's nothing to do with the, the, the uh, actual tonal side of the gate. Well, it isn't. It is, over, it is only part of the control circuit, but it's part of the attack circuit as well. So it will make a tonal difference. Um, obviously, switching to key listen and, and doing it that way is a nice thing to be able to see where you're at. Um, so that's that. What else was I going to say? Um, do you have to use any sort of gating on the, the vocals at times? Do you do a lot of gain writing, talking about the stage levels coming back into your vocal mics? Um, what do you do there, the ambient levels yeah, okay. coming back into your vocal mics? Yeah, okay. Well, that's a little prompt off Buford. Thank you, Buford, for that. Kind of got stuck there for a second. Uh, yeah, the gate thing, I think that pretty much covers that, doesn't it? Um, key filter, careful. Oh, yeah, hold and decay. I found that using shorter hold times and longer decays gives me a more natural tom sound. Yes. Um, because when I used to set them up years ago, it used to be just hold a very little decay, so it just went, mm. but that's not really a natural tom-tom sound. Um you have to definitely allow some mmm portion to make it sound real. So be care and I found that if you're gonna have longer decays, then you have to have a shorter hold. So just think about the envelope that you're creating with hold and decay. It's the same thing you have to do when doing compression. You have to I picture the um ADSL or the fil the, you know, the actual envelope in my mind that I'm creating when I turn the knobs. And that kind of helps me to set up gates and compression. Now, uh, moving on to off gates and compression, let's move on to actual uh, mic pre and line check and stuff. Um, I've taken to driving preamp mic pre's really hard lately. I I'm really into bringing them in to helping create the sound, as opposed to just putting the, the mix fader at zero and basically mix it on the gains. This has been a, a, a trait that we've done for a very long time. Um, we've all lined the faders up to zero and we bring enough gain in to make it work. Now, I we started doing that many, many years ago because when you were on tour, it was very easy to reset your mix every day. You know, the desk's been in the case, all the faders are all down, or they're all pushed full on. So you came up to it and just lined your all your faders all up at zero, and there was your base mix. It was you know there it's that's the fundamentals, but it's not really shaping the sound using the mic pre's. It's just it's like a line mixer. You're just bringing it in and busting it straight back out. Now we have digital consoles now that actually remember the position of the faders, which means the mix is going to be there regardless of whether you've got the faders all an inch and a half off the stops or they're flat at the top of the fader bank, you know, it's all going to be there. So I've taken to uh, driving stuff a little bit more to work the mic pre. So kick drums, snare drums, tom-toms and stuff. I'm actually kind of driving them in. Uh, even if I start seeing Ghost in Red, I'm fine with that. I'm because I mean, okay, I use nice equipment, so I, I'm I have the luxury of safe headroom above that. Uh, I appreciate there's possibly other things you would consoles you wouldn't want to do that with, um, but I still advocate running them kind of hot to give you the attack sound that you're after. And then I actually run my faders at like minus five. I'm like minus five on my kicks minus five on the snare. I've got three snares. I have two top, one bottom. I have a, a condenser side fire and a dynamic uh, ATM23, audio technical on the top. Uh, and I have a side fire condenser on the bottom. Um, they all run at, mi at minus five. Toms are a little higher because I found I like a little bit more drive on them. Uh, and then everything else is sort of minus five and all around there. So I move along. Uh, guitars tend to run at zero because the gain is kind of... I'm not looking to create uh, any kind of artefacts with the Mai Pre with the guitars because they're kind of sorted as they come at me. They're, they're not looking for me to create any of that angle with them. Um, all my VCAs, I use kicks, 
I have a VCA for kick drums, VCA for snare, VCA for toms, overheads, bass guitar, left guitar, right guitar, some of guitars, which is all of them. Um, and then I have a, a VCA for guitar reverb, which I use to place the lead so so solos in their own dimension without having to turn the volume up. It just sort of moves them to their own place without you having to go, oh, there's another three or four dB on the guitar solo to get it on your face. No, I place, I, I, for a lot of the solos, sometimes I just turn it up, but there's solos that Kirk does that I want to have them in their own environment. So I have a VCA fader for that. I have a VCA fader for uh, vocal delays because I'm, I use them a lot. Uh, and I have a Grandmaster um, vocal uh, fader, uh, VCA, and I have a Grandmaster band VCA, which I can then balance vocal against the band, vice versa. So, you know, if the vocal, if James is struggling a little bit, if he's got a cold or something's going on, um, at least I can pull the band back evenly uh, in order to feature the vocal a little more. Uh, so that's the VCA. They do run at zero, sort of. Okay, kicks zero. Snare drum I run at minus five because I, I need the drive because when Lars plays double kick drums and has to play very fast snare, the gain drops considerably and the parallel compressed snare, as much as it's probably got plus 15 dB of makeup gain on there and is compressing very heavily, it, it's still not quite enough to lift it against the, the, the pressure he's hitting it at. So I keep, I have minus five on the VCA, so I could give it a good plus 10 if I need to on the VCA. Uh, the bass I run at minus five for a similar reason. Sometimes I need to really add some heat to the bass guitar for parts. So I want to keep that window available to me. So I set that up to run at minus five so I can lean on that plus five if I need to, to give it a big bit. Uh, so I've got it all structured on the VCAs, but the channel income, uh, I dry, as I said, I'm starting to drive things in a much different way than I used to. And kind of finding it exciting because when you drive a kick drum kind of hard on the input, you're hitting the mic pre. When you move, do move the channel fader, even a couple of dB on the channel fader is a massive shift in the in the way it sounds in the mix. It's, it gives you so much more pressure very quickly. It's very the attack's fantastic. Okay, you're corralling it a little bit by having the mix faders down, but it, it's explosive. It's very very good. It works ever so well. So this is a bit of a new plot. I'm not advocating so much as putting the the faders at zero anymore. Um, Pull them back a little bit. <laughs> but line check um, sequence of events, it kind of, it, it, to me, the way I do it is I start at all the vocals because I want to deal with all the open mics first because they're going to be open during the show. So why wouldn't I get them out the way? So I do all vocals first and then I do all overheads and then I do all the hi hat. Uh, I say all the hi hat, I do the hi hat. Um, because I don't want to go, let's start at the kick drum, because that's channel number one on the desk, and then do kick drum and add a bit of brightness, snare drum add a bit of brightness, hi-hat, maybe brightness, toms, bit of brightness, and then go overheads, put the overheads on, they need a bit of brightness, I brighten the overheads up, and all of a sudden there's too much brightness in the kick, the snare, the hi-hat, and all the toms. If I'd have done the overheads first, then I wouldn't have had to mess so much with all the other stuff. So, and it's pre I mean, you, the guys who, who work mixing in small clubs with small stages, I mean, I'm doing this on stadium stages where there's 20 feet between shit. People who have like a, a lead vocal mic, three foot in front of the drum kit. Wow. I mean, I do club gigs as well. I know how hard it can be. But I, al I always want to have the correct diction on vocal mics it just how can you have a singer that's standing there talking to the audience and you can't understand what he's saying now that's inevitably what happens really when you start at the kick drum because you do the kick drum you do all these things all these inputs and then you try to add the vocal at the end and when you start to add brightness to the vocal to make it intelligible 
it makes everything else on stage far too bright. So then you're like, ah, shit. Can I really ask them to go back to the beginning and start again and then I'll make the vocal brighter and then try and start again well no inevitably what happens is you don't and then you struggle all night with trying to make the vocal brighter but you can't because everything else is too bright and because of the residual high end that's around off all the other inputs it's in danger of feeding back all the time so would it not laterally work out that you should just get a great vocal sound to start with and then make things fit around that? You probably won't need overheads in clubs when you've made the vocals, so the diction's clear and it's it's and it's a nice breathy vocal. You probably won't even need overheads. You might even blow the hi-hat off if the guy's a loud hi-hat player. So this is a case of thinking engineering as opposed to just grabbing the knobs and turning them. You have to think about what you're doing. I have sat and thought about every sound I've ever engineered over the years, and I can remember EQ off stuff, you know. I've done bagpipes. I remember what I did to make them sound good. You build up a, a, a repertoire of all this stuff. You know, Buford, you have a repertoire of things you do to certain inputs to just because yes. you know that's what it always needs. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you just do. Yeah, there's some standards. You know, high-pass filters. High-pass filters, we never talk about that, and we should really, because it's very important. Mm -hmm. You know, you start allowing stuff to go too low, uh, then, of course, you're going to create your own problems. But there are things that I've seen people do where, you know, they go, oh, it's overheads. Let's, um, let's high-pass them. How high? Okay, 450 hertz high pass on the overheads now okay they go and they sound like overheads sort of but there's a lot of nice energy a little lower than that but there is a danger of that then because now you're into allowing the overheads to do more of the same frequency as your snare and your toms so now you you could be into the phasing issues sometimes it's easier to just high pass overheads to a point where there will not be the frequencies in them that will interfere with all the rest of the kit. Ha! It's a trade-off. Uh, me personally, I'd rather sort the timing and the phasing out, and allow. I I normally allow the overheads down to about 250, maybe mm. even just about 300, depending on the the thickness of the PA down there, because okay. I want the. I don't just want the. I want it all. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's. Uh, this is all down to your eye pass filter. A little trick I did do a very long time ago, uh, and I only really use it, it was probably more of a Hail Mary pass, actually. I put a gate on the feed to the subs, and then I used the range control or the attenuation control of the gate uh, to set the volume of the subs for when the gate wasn't open. So think about it. You got... And then I keyed the gate off the kick drum channel. So what you've got is you might end up with play the bass guitar, plays the bass guitar. I bring the high pass filter down to say 50 hertz. It plays the guitar. There's too much sub in the PA because it's 50 hertz on the bass or it might not even have a high pass on there. And then I bring the range control. I bring it down from zero, you know, down to possibly minus six. So now the gate is turning down the sub six dB. Well, you'd say, okay, that's great. You're making the bass sound good. And I, do, I, used, I did that because when it was keyed off the kick drum, when the kick drum fires, it puts the subs to full volume. It, you know, you lose that six dB of reduction. And all of a sudden, and you set up the hold and release time to be a kick drum pattern. Uh, and so hit the kick drum, subs go to full volume, you get a burst of all that extra uh, unlow pass to bass guitar that you wasn't hearing when the, the gate was, out, was uh, open and the reduction was in. Uh, but hit the kick drum and all of a sudden you get that burst of bass guitar, you get the kick drum and the subs go to full volume. Wow. It's a, it's an interesting concept to do. It's uh, It worked ever so well. But you better line check with somebody playing the bass guitar and somebody hitting the kick drum because 
I got took by surprise a couple of times. It was quite amazing, the difference of uh, the sub, the amount of power that was available. Because you hear the kick drum on its own, and you heard the bass guitar on its own, and you thought no more of it. But when you heard them both together, wow. And, of course, uh, the low end in the guitars as well. You didn't have to high pass them so much for the simple reason is you're bringing the range down on the gate if it got too much. It, it it was just something I tried. I don't know if people out there want to give it a go, but it sort of, it was nice. It did work. I think it would work in a club situation where you want to get a good solid low end and not have any residual shit hanging around. Mm -hmm. I think you could get something, if you were a house engineer, I think you could get a nice little thing going there with a gate on your subs. Um, and not have to use so much EQ to... on the channel strip. Yeah, you, you also yeah, mentioned yeah. yesterday using a coin on the beater uh, for more high end. I thought that was very interesting. And and someone has asked, do you use a combination of mics on the kick drum when you were talking about uh, your low end connection there in the mix? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean you're talking about a long time ago with the coin thing. Um, we always needed more attack on the kick drum because. Uh, Lars liked to play with a felt beater and didn't want to use a wooden beater. I mean, obviously, a wooden beater is going to give you the massive attack on a plastic head. But um, what we found worked was a, a couple of quarters. I think, we had, I think we had two. And we gaffer tape where the beater hit. So as, as you hit them, the, the quarters clacked together and it added the click. Uh, of course, this now is a, a Dama click pad. I mean, you go and buy these things now that are more robust than the thing we made. But uh, it definitely did work because uh, we just use proper click pads now. As to the microphones, absolutely. I use a D6, Audix D6, and uh, an SM91 for the high end. Another thing I do, I high pass the... Um, the what do I high pass? Shit, get this right. I low pass the D6. I always get this the wrong way around. I low pass the D6 and I high pass the 91, so as they don't do the same overlap on the same frequency, because then you start getting into another path a phase issue there. You know, what's the point of the 91 trying to do the same thing as the D6? So I slide up the high pass on that. So I make a crossover in effect of the kick drum. The, the okay. D6 does the thump and the 91 does the high end and I try not to overlap them so as there is no interaction phasing between the two. Does that make sense? Yes, it, it does. When you're introducing those high pass... Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it, it really does. It, it's definitely the way to go. When you have two microphones on one source attempting to do the same frequencies you better make sure that they are really in phase otherwise they're just working against you you know as you bring up you want to put some more high end in the 91 you want to turn it up a little bit so the kick drum has more attack then the problem is the low end changes because there is a phase discrepancy in the low end between them so so you can delay one that the by, other. you can delay one to the well, other to, to get them to, to work when you've done the high and low pass you can do that. You uh -huh. can do the delay thing. Um, but I don't normally. I just make sure that the one doesn't do the same frequency as the other. I see. Uh, I just high, high pass one, low pass the other, and that's the crossover, really. And uh -huh. then, you know, I haven't got the 91 doing all the, trying to do the low end that the D6 is doing. And I don't have the D6 trying to do the high end the 91's doing. And then you just meld them together and pick the proportions of each. Mm -hmm. Did we talk about the triggers I use for the gating? I don't believe so. Let's let's go over that again, or let's go over it now. Yeah, just back. To, I, do, I I remember. I, that's why I thought we hadn't finished gating. Okay. I use um, like Pintech or Fishman triggers, and they're just taped to the side of the shell. They run through the infrastructure and go in the key input of the gate. So as even just tapping the shell lightly with a stick, that vibration with the piezo crystal is enough to open the gate. But you can blast the biggest noise atom you want, and they'll never open acoustically because they work on a vibration there. Uh, and what else I did, because I have uh, 
those triggers in real time, you know, you hit the drum, there is a pulse from that trigger. What I did is I delayed every channel on the console by two and a half milliseconds. And I only did two and a half because it, it seemed to sound right. I did, that's not a particular value. It was just like, okay, two and a half. And what I do is, because I've delayed the audio two and a half coming through the channel and the triggers in real time, I've actually created look-ahead gating because the gate will open when it sees the trigger coming. The audio actually is coming in two and a half milliseconds time. So the gate is open in anticipation of the audio coming through, which means I don't clip off any of the leading edge, which is all back to the attack thing. I mean, OK, I'm being a bit anal. It's going a bit to the nth degree. I'm going too far, but I've created look-ahead gating by using triggers, basically. And it does mean that you get the entire envelope of the toms and the kick drums. Can't do it on the snare, because they change the snare so often that the drum tech, the first time I tried to do it on the snare, he grabbed the snare, forgot about the trigger, and ended, ended up dragging the entire mic loom off the drum riser during the show with half the mics, because he just grabbed the snare and ran off with it, and it was still connected with the trigger. So I decided that we better abandon the trigger on the snare drum because it gets changed so often. But toms and kick drums works fantastically for so that's the uh, trigger gated. It's not triggering sounds. I don't do that. I don't like. I like real sounds with microphones, um, mm -hmm. except for the fact I use fractals now. But we won't talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, with all the advancement in technology uh, and, and the changes as well that's happened over the recent years, and especially computer technology and plugins, we're referring a lot to, but. Um, do you see this as a, uh, a, a challenge as well? And uh, sometimes we get distracted in, uh, in using all these tools, or are they absolutely beneficial for us? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, you know, mm, these plugins, I mean, I, I think some of them are good, you know? I mean, okay, fine. But, you know, I'm a firm believer in a, a good source sound, a well tuned system and a good source sound. I don't need punchers, trackers, followers, fucking whatever the fuck <laughs> these things do. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I mean, I'll, if, I, if it needs to be volume controlled, I'll compress it a little bit or I'll limit it. Um, uh, if it wants to have extra, more mids in it with some kind of a plug-in, I'll EQ that in. Uh, if a source is in so dire need of being bailed out, then I'll tend to go and address it right at the very beginning because it's making me, me job hard and needs to obviously be sorted out. Um, so, no, I'm not a big firm believer. I mean, okay, the Midas doesn't actually have plugins as such. It has its own, I guess, but it doesn't have uh, extra activity plugins. I, I, I could use a sound... Uh, grid is it or say uh, what they call those things the waves the uh, some rack isn't it I don't know I have looked at them I now I'm not mad keen I only use uh, uh, for effects and stuff you know I have um, for the snare drum I run two reverbs one of them is a, a non-linear that used to be like the RMX 16 AMS that we used to use years ago, which is like a, a reverse non-linear snare. And the effect that has with the snare drum is it makes the snare sound longer. Uh, because when you're outdoors and in some very sort of big, vast expanses, a snare drum with no reverb on actually sounds like very nothing, just nothing, like very little. Um, it's just a solo input that's very short in duration. This non-linear reverb actually makes the snare sound a little longer. Uh, and just it still sounds just like a snare, not like reverb. It's kind of an interesting program. Uh, Nonlinear, it's called RMX 16 AMS was the original ones who did it. This is on the uh, DN 780. I use it on the Midas. It was a copy, really, of the RMX 16. Uh, I use a, then a hall or a plate, depending on the environment. I mean, normally a hall um, with very little pre delay, if any. Because I don't need to be putting uh, the snare drum 
in another world when it's actually going into a really ambient world normally i don't need to be compounding the problem with a a 30 millisecond pre-delay to make it sound like Puka, you know because the room's going Puka, straight away so i don't want it to be going Puka, Puka in the blah so no i don't do that uh tom tom's same like a hall uh None of it more than 1.6 milliseconds because I have to have the reverb done and dusty before the next hit comes along and the songs are quite quick. So the last thing I need is a big long snare verb just trailing to the next snare hit and becoming a constant noise. So I, I keep those all kind of tight and tidy. Uh, vocals, uh, I have uh, a plate or a hall that I use. I have a couple that I play with depending on the the venue of what I feel's working that day for me. I do tend to do that a little bit. I don't have any hard and fast rules in that respect. I'll move things a little bit there because I, I like to mix it up a little bit. Um, what else do I have? I have a, a D2 because I don't like the Midas delay in the console, so I have a, a TC D2, which I've used for a very long time and just love the sound of that piece, so I stuck with it. I have a BBE 862, that sits on inserted across the subgroups uh, and gives me like a an overall tone control, if you like. It gives it's, I think it's 100 hertz and 10k. It works out. It allows me to give the, a little bit of excitement to the high end of the of the toms and also give them a bit of drive. Uh, I have a DBX 120x which I run on the floor toms, which is the big floor tom that you always hear if you come. Um, and then I can obviously use that to taste, single fader, mono. And that's about it. I have a Korg, yeah, the Korg DRV 3000, which is, I keep grabbing them on eBay whenever I see them, $100 here and whatever, because it's, uh, it's actually the piece that does the master effect for a song called Master of Puppets, uh, which is a pitched down, arpeggiated thing. And it's the only machine I've ever got it out of. I tried the H3000, even tied and the 4000 and the 4500 none of them did it like the Korg DRV 3000 so I just have to they've been out of production for about 20 years so I have to just grab all the ones that I could see we've got a whole plethora of them they're everywhere Korg DRV 3000 and it does all my interesting different effects that I need flanges and and stuff for um for the songs that need it but so far as any out, other outboard gear no not at all i have a dn6000 analyzer that i really like that i is my go-to sort of stare at guy uh instead of going for all the more far complicated looking displays that we we have available to us the d you know the the, the dn6000 is just that spectrum analyzer it's like okay that's the picture <laughs> And, I vary, and when I'm using that, I vary the uh, averaging time. So as I can see, if there's a build-up in the PA to frequency, I'll leave it averaging for like five seconds or something and see if there's one peak. Or then I'll switch to some faster, you know, your 1.25, 250 milliseconds and have a look at the faster transients to see if there's anything that I think might be leaping a bit there. Um but so, so far as any other audio gear, that's uh, outboard gear, that's about it, really. Well, one ask also, do you ever use uh, expanders in place of noise gates? I've tried this. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Because when I really tried this, I think the only uh, expander if you like, that was available, was the BSS 901, was it? I mean, do you remember that, Buford? I think I do, and it was an expander among freshman gate, yeah. Yes. Mm. I'm, um, no, not really. You can, I mean, I've seen it done. Um, Doug Hall, the guy who used to mix Iron Maiden, Doug was a big guy into his expanders. Uh, he had some really weird esoteric piece that I, he used to use, it blue thing with yellow knobs. And I always think, wow, that's an interesting thing. It looked a bit of a pisser to set up, though. Uh, I think, you know, making it turn the mic on and off as opposed to expanding the frequencies and ducking the frequencies. Um, 
I think the gate's an easier option. <laughs> I like I like to keep it simple. That yeah. uh, is it the, an analogy? K, K I S S kiss. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, <laughs> I, I I'm a firm believer in that. To be honest with you. No, I agree. Absolutely agree. Uh, someone else is asking about roughly where to use said high pass filters. And I don't know if they're uh, speaking of a particular instrument that didn't say on the question. And obviously that, that depends on the instrument. But you use high pass filter, filters pretty much uh, all through the input spectrum. I think you mentioned that, that most channels you. you, you... Yeah, pretty much. I would, I would say that every channel has a high pass filter on it, even the kick drums. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's no real, for me, there's no, I mean, I like, I love low frequencies. You know, everybody out there who ever knows me or has listened to me knows that I am a, a bit of a sub monster. Um, but even so, I still high pass the kick drums at 30, which should probably really be 35, but I can't bring myself to go up there. Uh, <laughs> so they're high, they're, you know, I just can't. It's just denied, that is. Um, so no, kick drums 30. I would say snare drum. Depending on the snare itself, I think I, with Metallica, I think I'm actually kind of low. I think I'm at like 100 hertz on the yeah. snare. Hi-hat, uh, he bumps quite a bit on the hi-hat because Lars is quite a violent hi-hat player. I have the mic positioned so it avoids the wind gust between the hi-hats, uh, which can obviously make a, a hi-hat mic bump quite considerably. If you're miking the very edge in line with the, the, the where the two symbols break apart. Obviously, as the hi-hat closes, it tends to push out a gust of air, which can cause your hi-hat mic to go, mm. Mm. you get like a hump with it, you know? Um, you can't really high pass that out. That's pinning the capsule. So moving the hi-hat mic to a, a less wind gust position uh, will help with that situation. But I still high pass it probably... 250 i would think 300 on the hi-hat i don't really want it going down there and the, you know if the riser starts taking a bit of a bump mechanically you can get some noises uh moving on to tom toms smallest tom uh i think that's about 100 hertz maybe even just a little lower maybe 80 and then the next one goes a little lower again and then the floor toms i allow to go all the way down to probably i think it's 50 but i'm keeping them kind of cleanish because the subharmonic synthesizer is obviously taking care of any 30 and 40 that's going on i just don't want the source sound to get any woo 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 going on because obviously that will translate into the dbx 120 and make that get a bit shirty so i keep the the actual source sound tightish Actually, the floor toms might even be doing uh, 60. I can't remember what I've got them at. Because it's obviously, I listen to them as much as I'm talking numbers. Uh, I'm trying to remember those numbers right there because I've tweaked those listening. Overheads we talked about, they can be anything, 250, 300. Uh, into bass guitar. Bass guitar tends to be, depending on how well the subs are working that day, uh, you know, are they summing, are they really hefty? That could go, I mean, I'm normally about 50 hertz, 50 to 80 hertz on the bass, maybe even a little higher some days. Not normally, though, because I like the bass to do some serious weight. Um, guitars, when I was using, well, as I said, I'm using fractals now, which is the sampled mic set, uh, guitar, which I was anti at first. Rest assured, I fought the cause for... 4B12s and microphones, but when you look at the at the benefits of the fractal, it was fantastic. The South Pole gig is what sealed the gig for the uh, the ISO chambers and the amp racks because when when uh, the South Pole gig happened, all the gear had to go ashore on Zodiac speedboats. Now you're not going to lift a 4B12 in an isolation chamber onto a Zodiac speedboat and take it ashore. Uh, the same as you're not going to put an amp, a, a huge amp rack on one of those and take that ashore. But you are taking a 2U 19-inch rack mount piece with the guitar sound sampled into it very easily. And it worked. They work fantastic. Um, so we adopted the fractals. We use fractals for absolutely everything now. Uh, all the guitars, even the acoustic guitar, 
uh, bass guitar is all these fractal pieces and my first time I tried them when they came along and, gave, and set it up to the factory heavy metal program if you like I'm like absolutely no fucking way that can just fuck right off that can because we'd spent 30 years getting the guitar sound together I'd had every microphone known to man inside that ISO chamber and moved around, moved forward, moved back, forget everything. And we finally got to a point where I was really happy with the guitar sounds, and as were the band. And now all of a sudden, I'm just going to go, okay, let's just throw that all away and get that 2U piece of gear out. But the difference is we didn't lose what we already had because the guy from Fractal turned up to the studio with the band. They set up the system and played our sound into it, and it learnt what we'd actually created over the last 30 years. And <laughs> as stunned as I am, it really is. It really, really is. The difference is the fractal doesn't have a bad day. Like sometimes the, you know, the Mesa Boogie amps are fantastic. They can have bad days. They are valve after all, uh, or tube as you guys would probably say. Um, so, you know, temperature, burnt valves, stripped anodes and cathodes inside the valves causing extra distortion, preamp tubes, all the various shit that can go on with a with a, a valve amp. We don't have any of that anymore. Microphones getting knocked inside the ISO chambers. I've had people actually backstage sitting on the ISO chambers, tapping the foot to the band's music, and they're actually banging the side of the ISO chamber, and you can hear it through the PA. <laughs> just because somebody's sitting on one of them. So it's yeah. like, shit. You know, because sometimes we used to leave them in the truck and just run mic leads and speaker lead out to them. You know, it's like, it had just, you wouldn't even know what they were doing. It was the all the guitar sounds for the whole show sitting on the loading dock. Hmm. But it was it was literally half a semi full of gear. And when you're doing fast moves around the world as well, and you're chartering aeroplanes to fly your equipment, the difference between uh, the amplifier and the fractal setup is probably half a million dollars in a bigger aeroplane. So, and there was no benefit to keeping the amplifiers and the and or a plethora of ISO boxes. And I mean, the ISO chambers with the 4B12 in each one of them was probably five feet long and a four, just bigger than a 4B12 square. And we had six of those. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about some pretty big bunches of flight cases, plus all the amp racks to run them. The fractals replaced all that. And, mm -hmm. wow, I mean, the parameters in those things are scary. That's my worst fear, is the backline guys, when they get the laptops out and they're plugged into the fractals, I'm like, oh, no, they're in there. Because, you know, it's they're backline guys. It's... It's not really in their remit to be messing with that kind of stuff, <laughs> in my eyes, anyway. <laughs> That's so, another interesting... Go no, ahead, go ahead, finish up. So, so yeah, with the high-pass filter situation with the fractals, they don't do quite as much uh, of the super lows because of no mic proximity effect or anything like that going on. They are a pure, clean sound. So I can high-pass those kind of lower. So I think they're probably down at 60 hertz uh, for the guitar, when normally, when it was microphone, I could be up to anything up to like 140. You know, I mean, really, I mean, you know, you'd be high-passing very, very high for, for guitar because the microphones just gave you all that extra low end that you didn't really want. Mm -hmm. um, the fractals give you the low end. It's already sorted. You just have to let it through, you know. And they, it, well, I can't say any more about them really. They'll, it's, it just works for me. So high pass on that, absolutely kind of low, but only because it's fractal. If it was microphone, would probably be 140, 150. Vocals for James, it's about 125 can sometimes slide up to 160 depending on the PA but predominantly 125s I am having to use the Shure ES55 microphones which is you know like that big square thing yeah. um, 
Super 55s. Actually, I think it's a harmonica microphone originally. Uh, James really likes the look of those. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to say any more about them. If you <laughs> saw what I actually had to do to those to make them actually sound like a microphone, you'd probably be quite shocked what the vocal EQ looks like. I mean, I have a parametric, I have a, uh, a 27 band graphic, I have everything uh, acting on those just to make them work, basically. Hmm. So they're a little quirky, but they need high passing, as I said, you know, 125, 160. And I do that high pass uh, globally on the global vocal EQ because I have, say, 14 vocals, I think it is, and they are all EQ'd with one EQ because I'm not going to go around each one going, you know, do number 10, blah, 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 do number 12, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Go back to number 10 because 12's like this and, and then you can't remember what each of them sounds like. It's one guy singing into all of them. So I have a parametric and a graphic EQ strapped across all the vocal mics on the subgroup so I can globally EQ all of them. So when I've done one of them, I've done them all. All I've got to do is make sure that, they all set, that the gains are all the same. There's no problem with the capsule. So it sound, one of them's completely out of character, so we change it. Um, I think we actually have 150 of those microphones, believe it or not. Mm. I mean, really have a lot of them. Yeah, we have an incredible amount. Because they get wet, they get banged, they get savaged. And I think they're an SM58 capsule in a square box that doesn't breathe very well. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, a little normal. I used to use Audio-Technica 5400s, which sounded so nice so crisp and nice but they didn't look as cool as the big square ones you mentioned yeah you so mentioned we, the 58 i wonder if that element you know could be modified to be put into the 55 to where you'd have the, the look that he wants but yet another element uh, did you ever try that i'm just curious well oh absolutely we did Buford. we went there mate i mean i wanted audio technica to modify the shoers they wasn't too impressed with that statement to be honest with you Obviously, you know, yeah, let's just make those Shure 55 sound like an Audio Technica. Mm. After they've had all the luxury of having Audio Technica pictures of James singing, it was fantastic for them. They were quite pissed off when he went to the Shure, I think. Mm. So uh, they were trying to be helpful, but it could only ever go so far. Um, sure. And because we go through so, through so many of those microphones, actually having a specially made modified one would have been a complete arsehole to get together. I don't nice. think it would have ever happened. And I managed to bail them out, basically. So we stuck with the bailout. Understood. Well, as we're coming to an end uh, to this, this has been a oh, wow, great fun. Uh, uh, it's such useful information uh, that uh, you have uh, conveyed over to us, and uh, many things that I think all of us get eager to go out and try now. Uh, would you sum it up by saying things uh, to the young people that are just getting started or want to get started in? Some advice for them that they should uh, maybe seek in uh, our directions in education or anything of the sort to get involved yeah, in this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's probably the, the most genetic question that we get asked, really. How do I get a job doing what you do, you know? I want to be an engineer. And absolutely, and it's probably a great time because there is more education around now than there has ever been for people to learn to be sound engineers. Be it, it makes it probably a, a bit like the internet in as much as, you know, there's so much more of it now um, and probably makes it harder to get in there. But there is no, there is no second thing to actually listening to an input, actually understanding what it needs to sound like, regardless of all the numbers, and all the bells and whistles and plugins and whatever, learn to listen. Learn to listen and and to manipulate the inputs to, to do what you need them to do to further the band you're trying to mix, or the band you are mixing, I should say. Um, bring something to the table. Don't just be that sound reinforcement engineer. We all know you can just go through, put the faders up to zero, 
turn the gains up a little bit and go through every channel and as long as there's nothing particularly that louder than everything else you'll you'll have a mix going it won't it won't be very dynamic it, it'll be quite lifeless and it'll be quite boring you'll probably be even bored doing that kind of mix don't be afraid to turn the knobs and find out what they do get daring I mean, you know, how many people have never added 250 hertz or 500 to an input because they think that that's a frequency you wouldn't normally mess with? You know, there's a lot of frequencies that people never touch. And I, I'm, I, I've been there. I'm as guilty. You assume that it's, that sort of works okay and everything's fine. But you've got to be willing to go there, find out what happens when you turn the knob. You know, because sometimes you turn it and it's a pleasure. And you're like, whoa, okay, I'll remember that one. And and you do, and you bring up, you, you build up a, a repertoire of all those little tweaks and fixes. You remember tone. You remember the sound. You know, what happens when I, I add this to a snare? If you add two, 250 hertz to a snare, um, that's where the meat and two veggies, really, in a snare, snare top. It, it really, that's going to put some energy into it, you know. Things like that, people wouldn't normally try it, but be willing to try it. But I can't stress any more than listening. You have to learn some numbers. There ain't no way around it. You do have to appreciate some numbers. It's nice when you can put a number to a sound that you can hear, uh, uh, you know, a frequency in a particular input. If you can put a number to the to that particular sound, you know, and we call it hurts and whatever, then it, it sticks with you better. It's it's it, it's for talking and, and conversing with other people. It's easier if you go, oh, did you hear that? It had a bit, I mean, like kick drums. You know, we all take out that low mid thing. Now, 160, 140, 130. You know, when I talk to my mate, Dave Nichols, shirt who mixes Slipknot, um, you know, we go, oh, I took a bit of that low mid out of the kick drum. It, oh, it was down at 120, you know what I mean? It's like you have to be able to converse with people, so we put a number on these frequencies. And it, get to appreciate what they are, even if it means playing with a graphic and pushing faders up and down on things, just so you know where this stuff sits. You won't always be right when you're calling the frequencies, and don't think the professionals are either. I'm not always right. I'm shocked sometimes when I go, Oh, that's got to be about 250 in that there. And then you mess with 250 and it ends up being 500. You can be that far out. You know, you're like, wow, how did it fool me? So it's something you constantly learn. You constantly refresh. If I'm off the road for a long period of time, when I go back to work, I have to sort of have a quick refresher on it. I have to learn what those things sound like again because I've not spent time honing in on them. Um, when mixing the show for your band, uh, occasionally take your hands off the knobs and off the faders and look at the band and listen to it like a member of the audience because that's ever so revealing. Because as soon as you put your hand on the console, you go deaf to most of the inputs other than the one you're touching. So sit back, enjoy your own show, and you'll become a better mixer by doing that. So far as actually getting the work itself, that's a really tough one, that is, because, you know, people have help uh, to get uh, get along. But you, your local service company, your local PA company is, is probably the place to go, really. But get some proficiency going first. You know, make sure you know what an XLR is. Make sure you, how it wires up. Do you know why it's a balanced XLR? You know, do you know the console flips one leg out of phase with the other, then adds and flips them back over, adds them together? So... It puts the noise that's been induced in the cable out of phase with each other, and it cancels it. That's how balanced line works. If uh, Sorry, how yeah, balancing works. If you don't know that properly, then read about it. It's all over the Internet. You've got no excuse not to know some very basic things. So educate yourself as best you can. I mean, you look at Maya, what a fantastic company. I have massive respect, which is why I do these things for this company. They're the only manufacturer, speaker manufacturer in the world that actually cares about the 
outcome of people's shows at the end of the day. They don't just sell you a box. They're trying to educate people and help to make them better engineers. There's a plethora of information online on the, the Maya sites. You know, you can learn a lot from people. Um, support them. Colleges, you can go to colleges and learn, you know, same courses or whatever. It's all very good. There's a lot of information out there. You are not going to walk into a local PA company and go, well, can I just come and load your truck and unload your truck for you? doesn't happen anymore. That's how we did it 30-odd years ago because nobody knew any better. We were literally glorified humpers. And then we had to learn. And Well, it was, you blagged it for as long as you could until you actually could do it. That's not going to be allowed now. You, you can't blag it until you've learned it anymore. You've got to learn it so you can do it. So go and learn it. It's a, it's a great career, and it's a lot of fun, trust me. And it's, it's fantastic. And I'm sure Buford would agree. Oh, absolutely. The thrills are just indescribable, I think, through the years. It, those moments, just like that picture that's up there for you, it's it's hard to describe what that feeling is like sitting in the middle of that. And we wish all of you who have been able to tune in that you have those moments, and you will. You keep up the passion and desire, and, and uh, these opportunities can certainly come to all of you. That was great closing words, Mick. We uh, thank you once again for your time uh, to to come here and join us on the Mixed Workshop on the Meyer Education Program. And and uh, I just want to say thanks again. I hope we cross paths soon and uh, again and uh, be able to, to, to see each other. But just thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your opinions. Absolutely fantastic. And thank you very much, guys, for being willing to listen to my wafflings. And uh, I hope to see some of you at my future concerts. Please don't be afraid to come and say hello. I don't bite. I know I look like I might, but I don't. Uh, and I love to speak to people. It's one of my passions in life. This job has afforded me that I've gone everywhere in the world. And I've met people from all walks of life. And that is truly wisdom and texture in my, for my personal life. And I thank you all. And uh, good luck, guys. Enjoy your careers. And I'll see all you guys soon. Well done. That's a beautiful invite. I'm sure many will take you up on that. And it's, it's great when we can share that, especially on the moment. So uh, thanks again. I want to say thanks to, to Gavin Kanan, our uh, director of the education department at Meyer Sound, who uh, puts this whole department together and keeps it intact. And uh, Jason McCarrick, the event coordinator today and of, of all of our seminars and webinars, we really appreciate that. And a very special thanks to John and Helen Meyer of Meyer Sound, who for years in operating this uh, and, and supporting uh, this education program uh, to help all of you out there uh, use your equipment more wisely and intelligently and to be able to get the best results you can uh, no matter where you're at and what your field is. So we really appreciate that support from John and Helen Meyer, and thank you very much. So uh, all to all of you, great careers. Uh, keep up the great work. Keep up the passion. Uh, wishing you all the best that you have a very successful career. We really thank you for your time and uh, then joining us here today. So we'll see you on the next go-round. Come join us again. Goodbye. <laughs>